pleasure to introduce my former postdoc advisor, Frank Rosenzweig. Uh, I won't take a lot of time, but quick bio. Frank did his uh, bachelor's degree at the University of Tennessee at Knoxville in comparative literature, which um, if you've never spoken with Frank, it really comes through or read his writing a lot of times that comes through. I am literature. Comparative literature. So, so he makes more literary illusions than any other scientist I've ever done. <laughs> uh, so a lot of which I don't have to have explained to you. Uh, he did some time as a postdoc at the Duke Marine Laboratory and then his PhD at Penn with Kelly Tatchell in biology. Uh, he postdoc at the University of Michigan with Julian Adams, after which he was hired onto the faculty at the University of Idaho. He spent eight years in Idaho before he joined the medical school at the University of Florida. And after about three years of that, he moved to Missoula, Montana, which is where he was when I met him, although we actually met in England. Uh, and he was at the University of Montana for 15 years before he came to Georgia Tech about two and a half years ago. And that's that. And it over Frank. All right. Thank you, Matthew. Really appreciate that. And thank you guys for coming out. I know that it's fall break, and uh, consequently, there is uh, sort of a diminished student population, or at least the undergraduates. And thank you also for the staff people who have showed up for this. Uh, I interact with you guys on a, on a weekly basis, and it, it's a special pleasure for me to be able to tell you guys a little bit about uh, what we're up to in the lab. So my lab group is broadly interested in some uh, basic questions, uh, I wouldn't even say in evolutionary biology, but in biology uh, related to adaptation and speciation, uh, thanks to Matt Heron, who is a research faculty leading the charge on this project. We're interested in the evolution of multicellularity, and in various ways, both supported through the NAI as well as through exobiology projects, we're interested in, in the origins of biocomplexity, sort of writ large. So the common denominator in terms of how we approach these fundamental issues is uh, experimental uh, evolution. And uh, for those who were reading the news last week, uh, there were people in chemistry and biochemistry uh, at Caltech, Missouri, and Cambridge who won uh, the Nobel Prize for using this general approach of experimental evolution uh, to uh, uh, direct uh, the evolution of proteins. So we use this to direct the evolution of microorganisms. We can specify the selection pressures in our experiments. We can do controls and replicate trials to the limits of our patients or our students' patients <laughs> or our budgets. And because we use model organisms that have short generation times and are easy to manipulate genetically, we can do things uh, that are, would really have been inconceivable um, uh, uh, more than a generation ago. For those of us who are using microorganisms to do this uh, evolutionary biology in the laboratory, we have the additional um, um, uh, power of being able to cryopreserve a living fossil record so that for any evolutionary series, we can go back to our freezers or to our Dewar flasks and their liquid nitrogen and pull out populations and pull out clones from those populations for detailed genetic and physiological analysis. <clears throat> so the talk for today is exploring the emergence of complexity in clonal populations and the, uh, uh, the, the, the Latin title for this, which is actually the prequel to one of the papers that I'll uh, talk a little bit about today. Let's see if I can make this happen, uh, okay, is ex uno plures. So this was actually the title given to this by uh, a colleague, a fellow NAI colleague at the University of Illinois, Nigel Goldenfeld. And what this means is out of one comes many. And this is kind of a play on our national motto, e pluribus unum, out of many comes one. And it struck me this morning as I was looking at this title that perhaps ex uno pluris is uh, a sad commentary on our political situation because it seems that out of one we are becoming uh, many, uh, many, many tribes, not a good thing. <clears throat> 
All right, so, uh, so what do we mean by clonal reproduction? Let's just do a quick review for everybody in the room to sort of get up to speed. We mean binary fission in bacteria. We mean uh, budding in yeast. This is a mitotic process which is, whose molecular biology is fundamentally different from that. We also mean uh, reproductive uh, mechanisms like budding in planaria. We also mean budding in other groups such as these marine invertebrates, uh, the bryozoans and the cnidaria, here represented by uh, anemones, and of course uh, clonal reproduction, oh it, there we go, um, includes uh, rhizome formation which is responsible for our strawberry gardens but is also responsible for these uh, beautiful patches of uh, aspen that you see out in the west that are largely uh, clonal aside from the few somatic mutations that creep into uh, the roots. All right, so what else do we mean by clonal reproduction? We mean mitosis to make a sand dollar body, so in order to make a, this complex multicellular organism starting from a zygote, you have to have a series of cell divisions. And in addition, you have to have mitosis to make a million dollar uh, baby. This is, this is early human uh, embryological development uh, leading to an adult of that species. This going through indirect development, that going through direct development. I'm going to get the hang of this soon. Mitosis is also required uh, to make uh, liver cancer or to make lung cancer. And so these are evolutionary experiments that take place in our own bodies. In fact, I would say everybody in the room has one of these experiments ongoing at the present. It's just that our immune system is doing a good job of surveillance over these. Um, uh, likewise, you have binary fission that can make chronic uh, uh, bacterial infections that result in uh, long-term uh, debilitating effects. So how then do uh, clonal populations evolve? So here you have an initial founder cell, and if you don't have any sort of mutation creeping into the population, then in fact you don't have uh, evolution. Um, all of the individuals are genetically identical, and so I'm sort of suspending uh, consideration of epigenetic uh, changes that might creep into this uh, otherwise clonal population. So. Is there, um, where is Randy? Is there, is there a delay on this always? So if, oh, come on. I really don't want to have to do this. Let's see if we can make this go. All right, so if you have mutation, uh, then of course you can, uh, then we become concerned with the proliferation of this strain. So here's a mutation occurring in the population. If this mutant uh, is not uh, a lethal mutant and is able to reproduce, uh, then we become uh, concerned uh, with the fate of that new mutation uh, in the adapting population. Bear with me for a moment, folks. Uh, that was probably not a good idea. Um, come on. All right. So how do uh, clonal populations evolve? Uh, they've long been thought to be uh, governed by two related principles, one ecological and one population genetic. The ecological one is that of competitive exclusion, and this is work that goes back into the early 30s, the work of Gauss and his famous experiments showing that if you have a pair of species that have a very close uh, nutritional and physiological uh, requirements and you try to grow them together in the laboratory that one eventually displaces the other. And so the, the, uh, the term that Garrett Hardin used to describe this in a famous paper in Science back in the, uh, in the early 60s was complete competitors cannot coexist, a nice uh, piece of alliteration. This is uh, supremely aggravating. Is Randy here? So we're having a little bit of trouble with the advance. Okay. So how do clonal populations evolve? The population genetic uh, corollary to this is that of clonal replacement. And this is um, a concept that was developed theoretically by the great geneticist Herman Muller 
also back in the early 1930s. And so what Muller conceived of, if you have this graph um, of individuals and the frequency of particular individuals as in an evolving asexual population, that you should have a new mutant arising on the background of the founding population, which itself is displaced when a new adaptive mutant uh, comes in. And on the background of this population that has swept, you have a new adaptive mutant that sweeps that population. So in this scenario, you have large asexual populations where you have a succession of fitter mutants that comp competitively displace one another over time via periodic selection. So do asexual populations evolving in the laboratory actually uh, adhere to these principles, these, this ecological principle and this, competitive, this uh, population genetic one? So here is uh, work that was done by my postdoctoral mentor back in the, uh, in, the, in the mid to late 80s. And what he and his colleagues did was follow the fluctuation in the frequency of a neutral marker, something that you wouldn't expect, therefore, to be under selection, right? And that neutral marker was a single gene that, when mutated, confers resistance to bacteriophage uh, T5. And the model organism that they were working with is just uh, is E. coli. All right, so this is an experiment, E. coli under glucose limitation, and this is on the y-axis, the frequency of these phage-resistant cells, and of course here is time uh, measured in uh, generations um, of these E. coli growing uh, where glucose is the limiting uh, reagent. And so what they observed was here is the increase in phage resistance at the background mutation rate. The deflection point was taken as an indication that you'd had a new adaptive mutant arising in the founder population whose expansion pushes these down. And then you have its subsequent increase, again, at the background mutation rate. And then a new adaptive mutant arises on the background of A and so forth and so on. And so counting up these deflection points, which in fact was a time-honored way of measuring mutation rate, uh, even back in the 50s with Novick and Zillard, they concluded that there had been the fixation of eight adaptive mutations in this population. So this suggested that indeed uh, uh, we had empirical evidence for periodic uh, selection. So let's bear in mind that this is 1987 and then let's go forward a generation, and instead of monitoring the incidence of a particular mutant, one gene, one mutation uh, in a population, my colleague uh, Gavin Sherlock and his student Dan Kvitek did population monitoring using whole genomes. So now we're looking at every gene in the genome of the simple eukaryotic organism, baker's yeast, and what he saw, again, looking at the percent on the uh, y-axis and generations on the x-axis, these are in fact called Muller diagrams in honor of Herman Muller. What he saw were so many beneficial mutations coming into the population that they actually interfered with each other's clonal expansions. And they interfered largely because their fitnesses in this highly selective glucose limiting environment were very similar to one another. So this is the first instance where something that had been theoretically predicted, namely clonal interference, was shown to actually occur in an evolving population. And what is clonal interference? It is in fact nothing less than a kind of a battle royale where one fittest genotype rarely prevails largely because their fitnesses are very similar in the evolving population. And something else to sort of take away from this as an aside is that we're sort of trained in Bio 101 to think of deleterious mutations are, are, uh, and neutral mutations as mainly what you see in evolutionary biology. In fact, the rate of beneficial mutations is, is pretty high. Okay. So can an asexual population evolve into multiple forms that coexist? Under these models of periodic selection and clonal interference, it would seem that the times in which you had multiple clones stably coexisting within the population was those, those were very few, okay? So 
But it would be interesting if that was indeed the case. And so we were curious under what conditions this uh, arises. So I'm going to use a term freely over the next couple of minutes, and that is polymorphism, uh, simply meaning multiple forms. And, and polymorphism here, in this context, in this talk, will refer to genetic polymorphism. But bear in mind that we'll be talking about the physiological polymorphisms that are uh, emergent uh, from those genetic differences. Okay. So stable genetic polymorphism can arise in temporally varying environments. And a classic example of this is the ongoing uh, Linsky experiments at Michigan State University. So what's going on there? You've had over the course of now since 1991, uh, Rich primarily, but also his students coming in every day and taking um, uh, a stationary phase bacterial culture, E. coli culture, putting it into fresh medium and letting it grow another 24-hour cycle, again taking a small volume and then uh, popping it like this. And what you have then are, a se are seasonal environments where the cells initially experience a replete nutrient environment, go through rapid growth, and then interstationary phase. So, the bottom line is they go over a 24-hour cycle from plenty of nutrients to very few nutrients. And Danny Rosen and Dominic Schneider and others have shown that you can get stable polymorphism existing in, this, in these environments because you get mutants that do particularly well in one or the other of these growth phases. Another classic example, uh, not here necessarily or only temporal variation, but also spatial variation. So Paul Rainey and Travisano, uh, Nature published uh, a very important paper uh, 20 years ago. And what they were able to show is that if you don't have a stirred environment, but simply go from beaker to beaker and let this beaker sit over the period of growth of these bacteria, that you quickly uh, arrive at a number of different morphotypes within the, poly within the population. Uh, a polymorphic population that's stable over long periods of time. So then it's clear that these sort of batch cultures, if they're not stirred, become spatially structured with respect to oxygen tension, and this sets up uh, selective conditions for different morphs to persist together in the same vessel, in the same evolving population over long periods of time. So stable polymorphism can arise in the lab, it can also arise and be perpetuated in nature if there's some sort of differential selection in time or space, if there's temporal, seasonal variation, or, or spatial variation. Another way of looking at this uh, from the population geneticist perspective is if there's some sort of balancing or frequency-dependent selection on the population that gives, at different times or different places, selective advantages to one or the other morph. But this sort of thing of polymorphism should not be stable in a constant environment and with one limiting resource. So about the simplest, though not <laughs> in terms of how you set up the vessel, but in terms of what's going on in the vessel, about the simplest experimental arena that you can uh, devise is that of a chemostat. This is not something that I made up. The great uh, uh, Nobel laureate from France, Jacques Monod, uh, was the first who pioneered this back in the late 30s and 40s. The idea here is that you have uh, all nutrients but one uh, present uh, in excess and one present in limiting amounts, and you feed this in a carefully controlled manner to a bioreactor. This establishes in this bioreactor, which has an efflux, it establishes conditions where you have physiological steady state and the rate at which the cells reproduce in the bioreactor is exactly equal to the rate at which they're being washed out. So you have a careful control over growth rate. In the experiments I'll talk about, we are conducting these at low growth rates under glucose limitation and we're aerating these cells uh, also. So this is a well-mixed, aerated, glucose-limited environment. Instead of these fluctuations, in a chemostat, the, cell, the number of cells is constant over as many generations as you have the, the patience to perpetuate the experiment. So you have then no, steady, you have, uh, no temporal variation, 
steady state conditions. It's well mixed, so you have no spatial variation. So in principle, uh, those conditions in the lab and in nature that promote stable polymorphism are, um, are averted uh, in, with the use of a chemostat. And yet you have uh, a number of examples from Julian's lab, from my work, from that of other laboratories, where you do see stable polymorphism, different genotypes persisting for long periods of time uh, in this simple uh, environment. So ex uno plures, out of one comes many. Uh, for the next five or ten minutes, I'm going to talk about strains that was, were isolated uh, in, a, in a paper in genetics by uh, Helling et al. in 1987. <clears throat> the bottom line is that these guys thought that they had a contaminated culture from about 300 generations on to this. They had uh, cells in there that were large and small. They had cells in there that were ampicillin resistant, some that were ampicillin sensitive. And at the end of the experiment, they isolated some colonies from that experiment that they could differentiate in this manner and, um, uh, for, and analyze them further. And then I came in a few years later and did uh, some other work on these. The, the, the main thing that they reported in this paper is that this ancestral strain uh, had this growth rate and yield in batch culture, and all of the evolved strains had differentiated from that ancestor in interesting ways. Uh, all but one were, had higher growth rates or higher yields, but one of them, in fact, uh, this E3 strain, had a lower growth rate and lower yield not in the chemostat, but when it was grown in one of these Linsky-style uh, batch cultures. My contribution to this was showing that you can take this simple community represented by these different clones, and you can take them out of the freezer and pop them into the chemostat, and they predictably uh, form a community of, of the following numbers where E1 is always dominant in the chemostat even though its growth rate and yield in batch culture is less than these other clones. So stable polymorphism of this nature arises repeatedly under nutrient limitation. So in a number of, of parallel experiments conducted with strains that are closely related to this ancestor, any time they ran the chemostat more than 100 generations, they saw these small variants that look like this CV103 strain. And so uh, the question then, and this is where I came in, was uh, if you have a single limiting nutrient, then both uh, Miller um, and Gauss predict that you should not be able to have clones uh, stably coexisting over long periods of time. So there must be something else in the medium that is supporting the growth of these other strains. And so what I did was consider all the various uh, fermentation products of E. coli, as well as all of the diffusible intermediates that are present uh, uh, in the glycolytic uh, pathway, as well as the TCA cycle and analyzed all of those in the spent media and discovered that, in fact, there were some of these overflow metabolites uh, and some of these intermediates. This is a, sort of a summary of uh, work from that paper. We showed that there was increased glucose uptake, uh, almost uh, twice as great glucose uptake in this E3 clone, but it left plenty of acetate. It also left glycerol and glycerol 3-phosphate. One of the clones has come to specialize on that acetate, and another of the clones is able to access uh, preferentially those uh, uh, glycerol and glycerol 3-phosphate. So this led us to propose this model that you have stable polymorphism being perpetuated in this experimental environment through cross-feeding. So starting out with an ancestral strain and over many generations uh, ending up with these others that are interacting in this fashion through these secondary metabolites. Well, it turns out that stable polymorphism repeatedly involves uh, these secondary metabolites. So in, uh, along came David Trevis a number of years later, and in those instances where these small colony variants reminiscent of the E3 type were seen, 
the majority of cases, you also saw these acetate scavengers uh, ar arising uh, in parallel. And so this uh, led us a couple of years ago to propose that in addition to periodic selection and in addition to clonal reinforcement, that there's another way of looking at evolution of asexual populations, uh, particularly uh, microorganisms, um, and it's like this, that you have a phenomenon that we call clonal reinforcement, which means that you may have periodic selection taking place, you may have clonal interference taking place, but both of these can take place on the background of a situation where you have novel variants arising within lineages whose basic physiology is intact, but these lineages are sort of wedded or welded together by biochemical interactions, okay? So this is, uh, this is what we're proposing as uh, an alternative view uh, to clonal uh, replacement and clonal interference, and we're not proposing it as something that is necessarily uh, to supplant those alternative views, but we suggest that, in fact, uh, clones may, uh, re may evolve this way uh, and incorporate these other models. So it turns out that clonal replacement or reinforcement can be, uh, it's pretty much synonymous with something, another term that has arisen in the literature, interclonal cooperativity. And this term is generally used uh, in uh, the discussion of chronic uh, infections caused by bacteria and fungi, as well as in cancer. And there is new evidence uh, coming forth um, even uh, over the last year that these sorts of interactions, positive interactions amongst the clones in a chronic infection, positive interactions amongst the clones in a genetically heterogeneous tumor are important for their diagnosis as well as for uh, their prognosis and devising uh, effective drug treatments. So what are these guys anyway? And, and when I say these guys, we're talking about this simple system we evolved in the lab, but I would invite you to think more broadly, to think about cells that might be in a persistent infection, say in the lung or the urinary tract, as well as evolving tumors uh, within the body. Are they cooperators? Are they competitors? Uh, are they something in between? And so Margie Kennersley and uh, other collaborators have been interested in the transcriptional patterns that underlie these simple communities and the genetic differences that help explain those patterns. All right, so here you, I, I want to walk you through this um, carefully. On the top is a heat bar indicating the transcript levels for a particular gene in uh, a treatment relative to the ancestor. So it's always this comparison. We can grow each of these clones by themselves in monoculture, or we can grow them together in a community, right? And so, again, each of these comparisons is relative to the ancestor. This means that the transcript level for a particular gene is high. This means that relative to the ancestor, that transcript level is low. So, the point then of this slide is that for many genes, the transcript levels differ when the evolved clones are grown by themselves. These are the same as when they are grown as a community. And just to pull a couple of out, here is uh, a glycoporin, lamb B, that's responsible for getting uh, glucose through the outer uh, membrane. And here is MGLBAC, which is a glucose transporter, which is on the inner membrane. As you can see, across the board, these genes are very highly expressed uh, relative to the ancestor. However, this is not universally the case. For other genes, the transcript levels differ, and we know that this community is about 80% E3, and yet the transcriptional uh, profile of the consortium or the community recapitulates E1, E5, and E6, and in important ways differs from that of the predominant clone when that clone is grown by itself. So what's going on? The inference that Margie came to was that the transcriptome of this E3 clone, the dominant clone, is different when it's grown by itself as compared to when it's grown as part of a community. 
And so how might that be? And what, that, what might that say about this sort of interclonal cooperativity? It turns out it's pretty uh, straightforward to explain. So this dominant clone is consuming glucose. It's very avid for this uh, primary, this limiting substrate, but it's wasteful in its use. And we know from um, our uh, experiments that it's producing lots of acetate. It also, it turns out, is unable to assimilate this uh, low levels of acetate through this pathway acetyl-CoA synthetase, and that'll come up in a moment. The bottom line is that we know that, just like we have product inhibition through lactate in our own cells, yeast have product inhibition through their fermentation product, ethanol, and the same thing goes for E. coli. They have product inhibition through acetate. Well, it turns out that acetate uh, product inhibition is mediated through its immediate, its, its previous step in uh, glycolysis or in fermentation, acetylphosphate. This compound, which basically backs up in the cell, in its phosphorylated form, is able to serve as a phosphate donor to a couple of key transcription factors, CPXR and OMPR. And the phosphorylated form of these effector uh, genes is, in fact, able to influence the expression of a wide variety of genes in the E. coli genome. And guess what? It is just exactly those genes that are overrepresented in that sort of interesting situation where E3's transcriptome differed when it was grown by itself as opposed to when it was grown in the presence of the other clones. Thus, E3, when it's part of the community, has the benefit that accrues from having E1 present with it, consuming this acetate. It relieves product inhibition. You don't have this uh, unusual rec or, or this re regulation of the CPXR and OMPR uh, genes through phosphate, uh, and it uh, essentially you have a community looking uh, exactly alike across the way, E1, E3, and so forth. So in what order did this community arise and what is the genetic basis for the expression differences? But you know, before I sort of launch into that, I'd like to, to point out that, it, that not only is E1 getting a benefit from the E3 strain by virtue of its consumption of acetate, E1 is also conferring a benefit on E3 in enabling it to continue to scavenge glucose at, at great rates. Um, uh, in the absence of product inhibition. So it, it is really a cooperative arrangement they've come to. All right, another paper by uh, Margie Kennersley, who did whole genome sequencing with Jared Winger at Stanford University. And their experiments indicated that major lineages diverged early in this experiment. So remember, these are simply clones that were taken out at the end of the experiment that are representative, or what Julian and Bob and uh, Chris thought were representative of these, these morphotypes. But these morphotypes uh, clearly diverged early in the experiment, and they've been co-evolving over long periods of time. So it might be obvious to you that this E3 clone, which was taken out at the same time as the E1 and the E6 clone, has many more mutations. This is, in fact, the, if I can make this thing work, this is um, uh, the result of the whole genome sequencing where Margie found unexpectedly high levels of nucleotide diversity. Almost 600 total mutations uh, distinguish these strains, <clears throat> and more than two-thirds of, or almost two-thirds of them are missense and nonsense mutations, and there's a strong bias towards transversions, in fact, 99% of these mutations are transversions, um, indicating that this is probably being driven by uh, hypermutation. So if you have a defect in DNA mismatch repair, that not only elevates the mutation rate, it also uh, predisposes uh, the, uh, the cell to accumulate transversions. And so uh, E3 turns out to have almost uh, a two to three order of magnitude higher mutation rate than the canonical wild type K12, but it also turns out that the uh, ancestral strain was also a mutator by virtue of another 
uh, mutation in DNA mismatch repair, a nonsense mutation in MUT-Y. So, ex uno plures, from one come many, but how? And so we're interested in which are the mutations out of these 584 that are actually the drivers of this process of stable polymorphism and which are merely the passengers um, in the, uh, the, that are hitchhiking along but these very beneficial mutations. And one of these days. So here's the ancestral strain. This is JA122. And this is a depiction of uh, important uh, steps that we believe are involved in establishing this polymorphism. And here is the E3 clone, and here are the, the driver mutations that we think are essential to the establishment of this, uh, this simple community. So this evolved strain, E3, has accumulated a number of mutations that affect glucose uh, transport, both across the outer membrane and the inner membrane as well as mutations um, in glycolysis and the TCA cycle, uh, uh, importantly in lipoamide dehydrogenase, which is a member of m several multi-enzyme complexes, importantly the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex here and suck AB down in the TCA cycle. Work not done by ourselves, but by others in sort of regular mutational screenings have shown that the particular mutations that arose in LPD in this strain have previously been shown to diminish flux through the TCA cycle and to diminish the growth rate of the cell phenotypes that we both uh, observe uh, in previous, uh, previous work in our laboratories. All right, so it turns out then that you can increase flux through the glycolytic pathway, so you have more acetate being produced by E3. It turns out that E3 retains an ancestral mutation that essentially restricts its access to that acetate through a mutation in acetyl-CoA synthetase, which is the high affinity uh, acetate uh, transporter uh, in E. coli. This acetogenic fermentation actually creates a drain on NAD plus in, in the glycolytic pathway uh, because you are uh, not regenerating it the way you do in yeast through uh, alcohol dehydrogenase. So in fact, it, this creates a redox balance in cells that are growing anaerobically or fermentatively, and that places a premium on anything that can regenerate NAD+, that th enables glycolysis to continue. Um, and so one of the ways in which you can regenerate NAD+, is simply by making uh, glycerol. So we believe that that has been um, one of the responses by the cell, by E3, that result in the production of other secondary metabolites. Another key mutation in this E3 strain, in fact, two missense mutations, are in PTSI, which is uh, known to have an inhibitory effect, these mutations, on glycerol kinase. So that restricts the access of this E3 strain to this secondary metabolite, uh, glycerol. So along comes E1, and E1 has a, uh, an insertion element that has landed upstream of uh, ACS. This results in constitutive overexpression of this key gene to uh, access acetate. And then the uh, E6 strain is able to uh, have access to uh, glycerol and glycerol 3-phosphate by virtue of retaining the, uh, it, the, the, the parental capacity to uh, assimilate glycerol. All right, so I made this point several times that under aerobic conditions, that this E3 clone is behaving like an anaerobic cell. So here you have the ancestor grown anaerobic. Here you have the ancestor grown aerobic. And you can see that because the denominator is lower, uh, the redox ratio of NADH to NAD plus is like this under anaerobic conditions and under aerobic conditions. E1, growing in the aerobic chemostat, looks more like the uh, aerobic ancestor. E3 looks more like the anaerobic uh, ancestor. So we believe that trade-offs here 
um, drive the evolution of complexity. You have one strain that's best able to scavenge limiting glucose, uh, favoring fermentation over respiration, and creating a redox imbalance, uh, putting pressure on the cell to regenerate NAD+. And this is supremely aggravating. E3 then has restricted access to acetate, and E3 has restricted access to glycerol. So then the primary resource specialist is a, a wasteful scavenger. It's avid for the primary uh, nutrient, but it's wasteful in its metabolism. So now we have three models for, of clonal evolution. This of clonal replacement, the old periodic selection model. This of clonal uh, interference, uh, shown very nicely by Gavin and by many others. And now clonal reinforcement that uh, incorporates elements of the other two, what, which is really based on the notion that you have, um, you have different lineages uh, interacting with one another biochemically over long periods of time in ways that are favorable to uh, their perpetuation. So are there any ecological or evolutionary advantages uh, to this arrangement? And this is where a, uh, a talented postdoc and undergraduate came into the laboratory and attacked this problem. So uh, Ashley Alexander, who's here, and Dong Dong, who's probably back in the laboratory, uh, integrated uh, GFP protein into these strains for the, with the idea of doing competition experiments. And here you have a pairwise competition between the marked ancestor and the unmarked ancestor, uh, and that essentially gave you a competition coefficient of one because uh, one, the uh, ancestor only barely displaces the marked strain of the ancestor, and so this selection coefficient is accounted for in all of the data that I'll show you here presently. So now here you have each of the evolved clones grown by themselves that have much higher fitness than the ancestor, uh, perhaps not surprisingly. And then you have the various combinations of E31 and E36 that can be grown together. And the highest fitness of all is that of the entire community uh, recon reconstituted as E316. This is reflected not only in the fitness differences amongst these different strains, but also in significant differences in their productivity uh, in the same general order, uh, increasing from the ancestral to the uh, individual strains grown in monoculture in these pairs and the whole community. The point then is that even under the simplest of conditions, biodiversity builds upon itself. And this uh, biodiversity building upon itself has biomedical uh, implications. So if you imagine in the panel A where you have a homogenous tumor and you have some sort of selection pressure such as chemotherapy and if you have chosen wisely your chemotherapy and are able to eliminate this homogenous tumor then in fact you have uh, killed the cancer. If in fact you have a genetically heterogeneous tumor and that the, uh, some of these uh, cells, these clones, are actually interacting with one another in a uh, mutually beneficial way, uh, then it means that you might be able to kill some, but not all of the members of this genetically polymorphic population. And those that are resistant to this selection pressure, the chemotherapy, are in fact those cells that are responsible for the, the relapse. So I'll call your attention and just read off the bottom here from a recent paper in Nature uh, Review Cancer. Cancer cells behave as communities, and increasing attention is now being directed towards the cooperative behavior of subclones that can influence disease uh, progression. And so uh, I submit to you that the sort of work that we're doing has direct bearing uh, not only on infectious disease, where we know that bacteria can crosstalk with one another, uh, but also in on cancer. So if these things, if these uh, communities form, how stable are they? And our collaborator at Exeter University, uh, Ivana Gudelch, divide a simple model uh, to address this question that's really based on ATP generation and glycolysis versus the TCA cycle and the velocity of the processes of glycolysis uh, 
the production of extracellular intermediates, the import, and the, uh, uh, and the TCA cycle. And what she was able to show is that the stability of these consortia or these communities depends on initial population density and the frequency of these secondary specialists. So in green, a primary resource specialist. In red, a secondary specialist like the E1 or E6 uh, strains. And here are these intermediate areas of, of resource, of population density and the frequency of the secondary specialist where you have, uh, can expect uh, cross-feeding to emerge. In a chemostat, this uh, y-axis here is really the fitness of the mutation giving the differential access to the uh, secondary resource, and this is the amount of limiting resource that you're actually putting into the chemostat. So then clonal reinforcement may not inevitably arise, and it might not even be sustainable when it does arise. And so we did uh, recently a repeat or a redux of the Helling et al. experiment starting with the same ancestor, J122, except and running it under exactly the same uh, conditions, glucose limitation, slow growth, aerobic uh, uh, metabolism, except now instead of picking out a few clones and analyzing them in exhausting detail, we did whole genome sequencing every 50 generations at 1,000x coverage. And so what this then gives you is um, recovery of every allele that has, that new allele that has risen in the population to a, a frequency of about 1%. In order to get a handle on the linkage relationships amongst these different alleles, how they're bend in different genomes, we did whole genome sequencing on 96 clones from each one of these populations at the point where we determined that allelic diversity had reached its asymptote, which typically was towards the end of the experiment. So then this is, uh, I'll just rip through some of this uh, genomic data. The rate at which these new alleles appear, so this is the percent of a particular allele, this is the number of of, um, of different mutations that are accumulating within the whole population. The rate at which they um, increase is about the same. This may look shallower, but bear in mind this is only 300 generations. Again, a large fraction of these are nonsense and missense mutations that one could construe would have some sort of uh, impact on fitness. The population sequencing recovered about 3,700 SNPs that rose to this 1% uh, frequency at at least one time point across the experiment. Again, starting with this same ancestor, a uh, majority of them are transversions. The clone sequencing uh, recovered about 11,000 mutations, again, uh, most of them transversions. In this slide, <clears throat> on the, on the y-axis, we have the clone frequency for a particular allele. Here we have the population frequency, so the frequency with which the allele appears in the population itself. And you can see for each of these experiments, there's a very good agreement uh, across the line between the, the clone frequency and the population sequence of frequency. What this means is we can have confidence in our ability to construct the linkage relationships using the whole genome sequence of these uh, 100 clones that we pulled out of each experiment. So now we can construct our own Muller diagrams. And here are some representative ones. Uh, in the paper, we actually have a lineage for all the top 50 lineages uh, that you can scroll through. Um, and um, uh, it's really uh, quite, quite amazing to me having witnessed going from one gene to being able to look at whole genomes. Again, Muller diagrams with percent or frequency on the y-axis, generations on the x-axis. And the take home from this is that you have some mutations like MGLB upstream that arise early and sweep the population, and you have others like HFQ that arise later and are kind of fine-tuning uh, the adapt uh, adaptation of these cells to glucose limitation. So um, certain genes are hit multiple times in independent lineages. And so here you have our, based on the target size of the GAL-S gene, or HFQ, this is the number of expected mutations. We actually see uh, many more than that, so very significant differences. Interestingly, we never saw any ACS mutations. We saw no PTSI mutations. 
we saw no LPD mutations. These keystone mutations that we believe are the drivers of the establishment of stable polymorphism in these other uh, experiments. Never saw this at all. What we did see is that most of the top hits uh, impact uh, glucose assimilation, and they do so in interesting ways. You have many of these uh, new alleles arising in, in different lineages within the same population. So evolution is really exploring a variety of different solutions to the problem of this glucose limitation. So we're pitching this as a new way, a complementary way to classical sort of molecular genetics to doing um, uh, analysis of protein structure function as well as understanding the wiring diagram of a simple cell. And so um, here is how glucose gets into an E. coli cell under glucose limitation through LAMB, the uh, glycoporin, and through MGB, MGLBAC. And here you have all of these top hits. This is the 10 top hits, and you can see that they all affect the expression of these genes. Uh, in interesting ways. And I'm not going to, I'm going to just take you through a couple of these and show we, what we've done additionally with, uh, with our experiments. So let's just uh, take a look at GAL-S. You have GAL-S or uh, to the binding site of GAL-S upstream of MGLBAC operon, you have like 40 different de novo alleles that reached at least 1% frequency in the population. Well, boom, here they are, uh, coded with respect uh, why their shape, which chemostat they came from, and the different type, whether it's missense, nonsense, uh, et cetera, and wh where they land in the GAL-S gene. Zero to a 100, that's the frequency with which they're observed in the population. And what you can see is uh, all but uh, most of these never rose b above 1%. Uh, this missense mutation in chemostat 1 was fixed, and these operator mutations upstream of MGL-ABC uh, uh, were all fixed. Here's another, LAMB. Uh, so uh, LAMB expression is key to glucose import, and con one of the things that controls LAMB expression is uh, HFQ. This is a, an RNA chaperone that controls uh, translation of, uh, of, of MIC-A, which is an inhibitor of LAMB, so anything that will um, screw up that interaction uh, is likely to increase LAMB expression. Here are the HFQ mutants. So again, zero to 100 percent, a few reaching high frequency, most at low frequency. Um, but what's interesting is if you take these mutations and layer them, uh, paint them, if you will, onto the protein, you see something really quite curious. Here's the HFQ hexamer, so it forms a, it, it's a multimeric protein. There's the distal face. Uh, where you have uh, RNA binding on the distal face. And now we're going to take the mutations and we're going to paint them on the molecule. And what you see is that missense mutations in red. Here we have nonsense mutations in blue. They're all located on this distal face uh, and on the rim side of the sixmer. These are the sites of RNA binding and they uh, almost certainly uh, impact that interaction between the, the RNA target uh, and this HFQ molecule, which incidentally has a number of other partners aside from uh, MIC-A. So let's consider this interaction, which influences ultimately LAMB expression. MAL-K is an inhibitor of MAL-T, which activates expression of, this, of these genes. And so here we have, what is it, something on the order of 22 MAL-K mutations. Uh, they, most of them go to low frequency. Here's one that has swept uh, the chemostat A. And if you paint these onto MAL-K, you see that all of these mutations, in fact, localize to the region where MAL-K and MAL-T interact. Uh, so uh, evolution has basically unlocked the key by knocking out the capacity of MAL-K to interact with this uh, partner protein. So the takeaways then from this Helling et al. redux is that deep population sequencing plus whole genome sequencing on hundreds of clones shows no evidence for this clonal reinforcement that I've been sort of banging my shoe on the table about for the last uh, 50 minutes. 
Instead, we see widespread clonal uh, interference. We see parallelism in the sense that we see the same genes being hit in uh, different experiments, the same genes being hit in, diff in different lineages in the same experiment. We do not see any of these key cross-feeding mutations in ACS, PTSI, and LPD. And what this really, um, I would have you take home from this, is this is the importance of historical contingency. That either the presence or the absence of certain mutations in an evolving uh, population can actually uh, uh, favor or preclude the evolution of other, or I won't say the evolution of, but at least other uh, genes uh, going to fixation in that population. And then the, the last point to take away from this is that adaptive genetics is complementary to molecular genetics, and we can use that to eliminate a cell's wiring diagram as well as to gain additional insight into protein structure function by doing this business of painting adaptive mutations, mutations that we know are, if it, if it goes to, from, from one cell out of 10 billion to 1% frequency in the population, so even if it winks out of existence, at, for some period of time, that is an adaptive mutation. And we can paint these onto three-dimensional structures and get uh, interesting insights um, um, into the structure function relations and, the, and how uh, proteins bind with their partners. Okay, in the interest of time, we've been slowed down a little bit with the uh, um, AV, but I will stop it here and say that the people who did the work were Margie Kennersley, Karen Schmidt at University of Montana, Katja, Jared, and Gavin at Stanford. Always a shout out to my postdoctoral mentor who's been an um, um, uh, important figure in my life. Uh, Eugene Kroll, Ashley Alexander, Dong Dong Yang, uh, all working in the lab here at Georgia Tech, and our laboratory manager, Emily Cook, who is uh, truly an indispensable member of our team. I thank you for your patience, and uh, I'll take any questions. take any comments. Matthew. I have one question that I'm going to phrase two different ways because I, th I think I think they're the same question, which is, um, first, do you see this clonal reinforcement as a different process from negative frequency dependent selection? And the other way of asking the question is, how do these clones behave in reciprocal invasion experiments? Uh, I will, I'll start with the second one. And I will say that um, in the reconstruction experiments that, that I did, we always biased, I always biased, it wasn't anybody else, I, I biased the result in, in trying to put them in at the frequency that they were, that they were observed. Um, um, there were some experiments where I would start them at equal frequencies and they would sort themselves out. But I never did the, um, the experiment of say establishing E3 and then throwing E1 in there and see how, you know, how well it does. They were always put in there together. So that, actually, it's an interesting experiment. You know, could E1 evolve an E3 population? My prediction is that it would be able to very easily because we know that E3 is leave, living a lot of uh, acetate in the medium. But the experiment has not been done. Is it different from uh, negative frequency dependent uh, selection? Is that, that was question number one. Um, I actually used that term in my in that 94 paper uh, and in fact explored that possibility by changing the amount of substrate so uh, you can play with the uh, equilibrium uh, um, abundance of these different clones by changing the amount of glucose that you feed in. You can also change it by uh, putting in acetate or putting in glycerol uh, and so um, I, I think that I think they're very, it's very similar. Okay. Yes, sir. How sensitive are the uh, mutation rates to the uh, changing growth rate? So if you're treating your chemostatin to 
speed everything up where we get much more restrictive. So the question is, is mutation rate uh, sensitive to growth rate? So the, 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 uh, the immediate answer to that is, I haven't done that experiment. Um, and I'm trying to think that if anybody has done so with the explicit uh, purpose of seeing what mutation rate would be under those different circumstances. Um, one, so here I'm going to venture into the land of speculation, which is a, a fun place to be. So it's, it's pretty well established uh, that, uh, that you have an increase in the incidence of mutations under, under stress, right? And in fact, when Monod uh, uh, first invented the chemostat, uh, he called it a mutation machine, right? So if, if the, the idea he was trying to get a handle on mutation rate, but also wanted something other than just UV light or hydrogen peroxide to actually make interesting mutants. And he had the insight to um, make uh, interesting mutants in a very directed way by placing these under some sort of nutrient limitation, but paying attention to which nutrient, you know, was being limited. <clears throat> so um, to the extent that say, uh, so these were conducted at 0.2 per hour, which means that the whole population has to double every five hours in order to sort of keep up with the, with the delivery of the medium. <clears throat> um, if, if dialing it down to say 0.05 is in fact more stressful to the cell, and I think we could argue that it, that it would be because um, they would be, you know, even, even less, you know, uh, nutrient uh, is available because uh, there is this relationship between uh, growth rate and the and the equilibrium nutrient concentration, then I, my speculation would be that you, you might see a higher mutation rate. On the other hand, let's sort of argue it the other way. So, um, so a, a, a variation of this sort of continuous delivery system is something called a turbidostat. A turbidostat is where all of the nutrients are present in superabundance and you are diluting the, the vessel at a very high rate, uh, close to the maximum specific growth rate uh, of whatever the cell is that you're playing with. <clears throat> and on one hand, you might say, well, these guys are in fat city, they should be just fine. On the other hand, we know that, 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 that uh, transcription itself can have an influence on mutation rate. And to the extent that these cells are carrying out transcription at certain loci at just, you know, basically as, as fast as they can because they're reproducing as fast as they can, then you might have uh, a high mutation rate under those sort of mu max conditions. Um, I, I will, I have a colleague at, at Colorado who does turbidostat experiments. Uh, she doesn't do chemostat experiments. I, I, I would, I would, I'll ask her to sort of weigh in on that. So I could argue it either way, that you might see an increase in mutation rate sort of when you approach the, the mu max, and then you would, might see an increase in mutation rate when you get close to um, uh, out and out stationary phase um, in, in, in a chemostat. This is, that's, a, that's the best hand waving that I, <laughs> that I, I can do here. But it's a great question. Ashley? Um, so I guess continuing our time in the line of speculation, on, based on the model that Pete Bonham created, would you speculate that in a tumor environment, if excess glucose is available, then it's more likely for a cross-feeding uh, event to emerge in a tumor environment? And conversely, if you were to limit the amount of glucose, you'd be less likely Yes. So the answer to that question is yes. So as, as, as many of you guys know, uh, it has been known since the 1930s and 40s that uh, most uh, tumors exhibit, you know, kind of a Warburg effect in the sense that like yeast, they are very avid for glucose, but even in the presence of oxygen, they carry out fermentative metabolism. Uh, 
it's, it's, a, it's a curious thing that so many cells achieve their maximum growth rate on glucose uh, under fermentative conditions. And it turns out that most cancer cells exhibit this as sort of a, it's like a, a, bl a blueprint of a cancer cell. What this leads to, and this again has been known for decades, is that uh, for say a solid tumor, the pH of the environment in a solid tumor is very different from the pH of the surrounding tissues. And this is due to, to nothing more or less than the produ production of our overflow metabolite, lactate. Right? So the presence of so much lactic acid building up locally in a solid tumor leads to very a very different uh, pH profile. I think what you're su suggesting, Ashley, is do, do you get uh, interclonal cooperativity arising within uh, solid tumors where there is the possibility for uh, lactate and other overflow metabolites to be locally confined, uh, providing a, a secondary resource for primarily um, oxidative cells to, to, to consume those. Uh, I, I think that, the, I would say yes. Um, to my knowledge, no one has you know, specifically uh, uh, addressed that question, but then you ask the other question, would glucose limitation uh, have um, an effect uh, overall on cancer? And I think there, there are actually a lot of people who are trying to, uh, to look at this question. Uh, we know that caloric restriction uh, is, is the only way that you can extend the chronological lifespan of, of any cell, all right? This has been shown you know, from yeast you know, all the way up to primates whether this also has, um, an, whether part of the equation, at least in higher eukaryotes, is staving off cancer by being on a near starvation diet. Um, I don't know that anybody has sort of connected the dots there, but it is, uh, it is, an, it is an interesting correlation. And I know that, for example, this is something that Genia is interested in, is basically starving cancer cells uh, as a way of um, of uh, at least making them more making them more vulnerable to chemotherapy. Yes, sir. Um, thank you for the talk. It's really interesting. Um, just wondering, your work is centered around, I guess, uh, in the bacteria around uh, glucose metabolism. Is there any evidence that um, this sort of uh, Cooperation in a population structure happens around more than just one initial condition or one initial substrate, so glucose metabolism and lactate for, as well. Or, or, you, or using a different limiting nutrient like phosphate or something? Um, or? Yes, using a different or can it happen with multiple nutrients at once? Can it happen with multiple nutrients at once? Well, you have asked that question in the right setting. So um, our colleague over here, Matt Heron, uh, did uh, published a paper in PLOS Biology uh, about four years ago, and uh, this was a serial dilution uh, experiment, but he actually was doing a dual nutrient uh, experiment with acetate and glucose, also using E. coli, but with a different ancestor. Matthew, would you care to comment? Well, it seems like sort of diversification or similar degree, relative to some sort of now you might uh, ask the question, um, is there a, a substrate on which you would not expect this to occur? Um, and it seems to me that the, the, the key to this particular type of interaction, and maybe to interaction in genetically heterogeneous tumors, is having a, a fermentable carbon source. In other words, uh, you, you, you have uh, almost like the, the Greek uh, mythological creature, you know, the, the, the harpy. You have something that is, that is devouring everything at the table, but is excreting it, uh, you know, almost as fast as it's, it's, as it's eating it. And so that creates opportunities for these other clones uh, to specialize. But if you had, a, say, a simple um, if you had a simple carbon source, if you were limiting on a simple carbon source like acetate or glycerol with which 
just about all you can do with that is to turn it into carbon dioxide and some biomass and you know, get a few ATPs and reducing equivalents out of it. I would say it would diminish the likelihood that you get this sort of interaction established just because there's not that many ways that you can push metabolism. If that's the only thing that you're eating, there's not many ways that you can push metabolism to produce, you know, secondary resources. Does that answer your question? Yes. Now, if it, now you might say, well, okay, let's forget about a simple carbon source. What about we, we limit on ammonium, right? You can limit on ammonium or nitrogen or sulfur. Again, I think it depends on, um, I think it depends on the carbon that's being fed to the cells, whether it's fermentable or non-fermentable, uh, that sets up the possibility for these sorts of, of cross-feeding interactions. Yes, sir. Chance. Do you think such a high uh, rate of transversions, I guess, is the, is the mismatch repair? Is it like the driving force of all like, most of your mutations? Like, does that mutation arise first, and then you get all these subsequent mutations after? That's a great question. So the question is, in these particular experiments, a complicating factor is the, um, is the fact that the, the ancestor is a mutator that has about an order of magnitude higher than wild type, and then this clone that appears, or this, the lineage that is, uh, is driving the, uh, the cross-feeding uh, has an even higher mutation rate. Um, uh, restate your question again. I'm sorry, I was... Is that like the initial... Like right. Kind of the driving force? Yep. First yes, thank, th thank you. So, um, unfortunately, in that experiment, uh, we don't know exactly when um, that mut M mutation arose. What I can say is, um, so, so Margie, for one of her papers, did go back, and so we have these driver mutations that we think are important to the establishment of this community. And what she did was go back to the point in the experiment where uh, uh, these small variants first arose. And I will say, at that, at that point, the driver mutation, when I say arose, that means they had reached a certain frequency in the population where you could just see them on a plate, all right? So they were pretty abundant at that point. So at that point, you had the LPD mutation. You also had uh, the mutator mutation. So at least halfway through the experiment, we know that this uh, defect in mismatch repair arose. Uh, accounting almost certainly for the fact that you see so many more mutations in that lineage than you do in the other two. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. I appreciate your time. Good luck with the semester.